you only need to do something twice to make a tradition of it. So let's slide into our matching onesies, break out the polythene tub of Degle Noors, and sit back for another trio of Christmas specials. Perhaps you've got one relative notorious for rubbish presents, and when you see theirs under the tree, you rip it open first just to get it out of the way. Well... It's Keith on Orville's Christmas Circus! This went out on Christmas Eve 1985. Imagine being chock full of Christmas fever, then Keith Harris turns up, and now you're begging your parents to join the Jehovah's Witnesses. And here's Keith Harris! Something familiar, something peculiar, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. I have a feeling we're definitely going to see... Something appalling! Ah! Bipedal cuddles. Horrible. If Pennywise was after me, that's the form he'd take. Here's I went on one of those ayahuasca retreats puking up my soul in the jungle. Everyone else talked to their dead ancestors, while I just saw this. Keith's vent face is that of a man having his prostate tested by King Charles. But hang on, this is all a dream. Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! Orville, turn round, wake up! Thank you! The caravan and neckerchief denotes they are portraying the traveller community. Well, I know you're tired, and I must admit I'm tired. You are? Yeah, I'm very tired. Tired of trying to make ends meet. Listen to the routine here and see if you can spot his favoured structure. You believe in wishes? Of course I do. You do? I got a built-in wish thumb. <laughs> a built-in wish thumb? Yeah. Cuddles doesn't though. Oh, he doesn't believe in wishes? No, he doesn't. Do you know what? What? He took me to see a wishing well once. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. And he made a wish. And he made a wish. Harris only did ventriloquism because he figured out you only had to write half as much. I sneaked in the other night, you know. You sneaked in the other night? This lady on a horse. On a horse? And she dropped a handkerchief. She dropped a handkerchief? I got some Christmas cards. Yeah, Christmas cards. And Christmas pud. And Christmas pud. Yeah, and pies. And mince pies. It got me an empty box. An empty box? Yeah. 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 Yes. So the plot for this thing. Keith and Orville used to work for Great Uncle Charlie's circus. But when he died, they couldn't find the will. Then a rival ringmaster swooped in, with a document claiming he had rightful ownership, leaving Keith in rags. That circus should have been mine, you know. Yours? Hmm. You see, that circus used to belong, belong to my, my great uncle Charlie. If only we could find the will, we'd be all right, wouldn't we? We would. The name of this villain said perhaps a thousand times over 45 minutes repeatedly letting you know that a classic Harris punchline is on the way. Oh, you mean that fella Hans Neeson? Yeah. I'll tell you something, though. What? That Hans Neeson's a real baddie. Wonder what it's going to be. Props to Hans for giving an unnecessarily insane performance in this literal sideshow. That's what I've been telling you. Dishonesty is the best policy. Right, right. Hands is backed up by henchman Eli Woods, a sort of British Andre the Giant of awful comedy. Whoa! You're supposed to be in my mind, right? Mind? I could be so good to you. Listen very carefully. 
I shall say this only once. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> but we learn, surprise, surprise, that Hans's deeds to the circus are fake. This document is counterfeit. You got it? Counterfeit. One, two, <laughs> What are you doing? I'm counting feet. <laughs> And he wants to steal Orville. <laughs> that Keith Harris has uh, something else that I want. What's that? A talking duck. Back at the little top, here's Dippy the Dinosaur, a third character which never took off like the duck or chimp for some reason. Oh, got it! Oh, got it! Oh, I've got it! Oh, I've got it! In a wild move though it's someone else inside a costume, and the voice could easily be dubbed or done from within. Harris chooses to do it live. No, it's for the circus, you know. Oh, a great feat for the circus. Yeah, it's my new trick. Oh. <laughs> Poor old Dippy. Leave him in there if he's going to be running about. <laughs> it's always distressing the care he takes when handling Orville, whereas Cuddles is just swung about by the head, leaving his limp body to hang like an empty funeral suit. Here we get an example of a classic laboured Keith Harris gag. I'm going to call myself the great... Uh... Yeah. The Magnificent, uh, uh, the Great Defino. The Great Defino? Yes, a wide Defino. I'm the little Defino. <laughs> he loves this one too. What are you? I'm <laughs> stupid. Yeah, you can say that again. I'm <laughs> stupid. <laughs> you could say that. I just did. When you see someone you know coming up the street and go, what? Right versus when you suddenly bump into them. Hey, Keith! Hiya! For a circus-based show, there's precious few actual circus performers. <laughs> Have you done this before, sir? Definitely not a cameraman pulled in as a last-second replacement. Come on, don't be like that, because it is Christmas Eve, you know. I know. You wouldn't know it from the show, which hasn't felt at all Christmassy. Anyway, Dana's here. Orville, this is Dana. Hello, Dana. Hello. In storyline, she too worked at Uncle Charlie's old circus and dressed as a fancy toilet roll holder, does a song. Then Hans shows up for some duck napping. Haven't you stolen enough, Neeson? No, yeah. I want that talking duck. Me? The Orville? Ha, no way. Oh, it's Rumble. <laughs> Me, Hans Neeson. Right, Hans Neeson. And, and there it is. That's not Uncle Charlie's signature. This is a forgery. Come on. It's the fixed expression, mute and moving too fast like he might suddenly lunge at the camera. And next thing, there's two thin orange arms reaching out of the screen. They find the wheel and everything's okay. Oh, well! Here it is! Cuddles! It's the will! The will! You can't send them to prison, really, because it is Christmas. <laughs> well, it's Christmas even, I suppose you're right, Orville. All right, but clear off, you two! Come on, Come on, you sir! Sir! They can't It's your fault, you know! Hand me and Lacey! <laughs> but no notice at all, the big opening's tonight, and you know what that means. A disgustingly sickly Harris song. Well, it's Christmas Eve, Orville. Yes! And we got our circus, didn't we? I know. So you see, your dream for me did come true. Sorry? Your dream for me did come true. All our dreams did. And our nightmares. 
Oh, you can pronounce it then. starting to snow it is snowing and of course the lovely christmas tree oh. you know that's evergreen and i'm evergreen i know <laughs> oh, there's no wolves in the woods that'd be awful oh. orville it's absolutely perfect are you happy Look at that face. Nailed it. Another television classic. Now, I want you to prepare yourselves. I'm serious. Maybe if you've got bad anxiety, just leave the room for a bit. Okay. Hey, I wonder how Cuddles is getting on with the orchestra. I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> Be a clown, be a clown. But Doctor, I am Keith Harris. I thought that you'd want what I want. Sorry, my dear. Let's not be too hasty. We might want the same things. <laughs> nope, right the first time. Everybody, and happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Bye! As an ultra annoying child, my Bible was Gary Wilmot's The Right Impression, a book which promised you could mimic your way to success with such tips as glue Rice Krispies to your face as Adrian Mole's acne. Viewer, I failed to mimic my way to success. And now I make videos about Orville for a pittance. Gary's somewhat of a forgotten figure, big in the 80s, before leaving television altogether for a successful stage career. At his peak, following a run as part of the ensemble on ITV's Copycats, he land his own show, Q Gary, which aired a Christmas special on December 27th of 1987. Now there's a festive title sequence. Though it's a sketch show, the framing device is pure sitcom, with a proto Sean show vibe. Oh hello! <laughs> we had a party last night, started off with a glass of wine over Mary Poppins and ended up in the cupboard. Q Gary is a piece which defines 80s British comedy, with dialogue like this. Oh, oh we had a bit of a do. Do? Do. <laughs> Next time you could do your do somewhere else. Oh, what would I do without you? Clear up your own do. That'll do. <laughs> Wacky friends and neighbours. Life's full of little surprises. <laughs> <laughs> Random objet d'art in an enormous, oddly shaped house and observational comedy. I mean, why do we kiss under mistletoe? We kiss under bus shelters, but we don't rip them out the ground and hang them from the ceiling by a drawing pin, do we? Throughout, we get a running bit with a delivery man bringing each verse from the 12 days of Christmas. Yes! A partridge in a pear tree? Yes. Is it for me? Yes. Oh, who sent it? Yes. Oh. Two turtle doves? Yes. Yes. 
very, very occasionally for a supposed sketch show. It does segue into sketches. I wonder if monarchs have always given a Queen's speech. I wonder if Henry VIII gave a Queen's speech. <laughs> this next bit's as true in the 16th century as it is today. Now I know many of you will be spending Christmas sitting on a damp rag in the middle of a rat infested beat bog. Well, it's not my fault you were born a peasant. And Gary even gets a song, which goes full West End. Underneath me skin, I get a tingling Christmas shopping. There's nowhere I like better than to go. You can do the for your uncle Trevor, or some undies if he ain't that clever. Honestly, I wish there was more of that and less of... Gary, Gary, do you want to pull a cracker? Yes, my darling, what are you doing after the show? <laughs> Partway through, things break for a carol, and you're waiting for the joke, but no, a very sincere boys' choir. Just another 20 seconds and I can wipe my eye. Gary was best known for his impressions and gets to reel a few off. Well, in that case, who's responsible for sending me this splendid pear tree decked with partridge? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Five gold rings. You'll like this. Not a lot. My God, look at the state of this place, my God. Most interesting ad in the break is Harry Enfield as a pseudo beastie boy. Then it's just a mad run of celebrity cameos. Oh, it's Jim Bowen! How Mr. Grimsdale? That's a new sardine. Is that, is that an anagram of sardine? Pilchard. What? Oh no, what's wrong with him? Doorbell. How can it? Come in! Come in! <laughs> In this era, all sitcoms had a single plot, forced to hide chaos from a boss or landlord or mayor, even at Christmas. Oh, do you need something else? You yes. don't have any pets either, uh -huh. right? <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have any pets. No, you absolutely right. We wouldn't dare. Oh, I was talking uh, to the geese. What geese? What geese? The geese. Geese are next door. Sandwich? All those deliveries lead to a huge bill from Mr. Patel's corner shop, and oh, Gary! I don't care what his name is. He's not packing reindeer there. <laughs> At your servant, sir. Hello, Mr. Patel. It's Gary Wilmot. Ah, Gary Wilmot, housewife superstar. <laughs> He's even got the head wobble, and this is the punchline they've been building to the entire show. The only thing I ordered was a dozen boxes of dates, a dozen packets of crisps, and a dozen packets of nuts. Twelve dates, crisps, nuts? Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking you are saying twelve days of Christmas! <laughs> Hope all the writers were in that cabin. For our final show, we're watching CBBC's Panto from 1984. Their televised pantomimes are still going today, but if this one's ever repeated, it will need one of those warnings about being a product of its time. Pantomime is the most freeing of all the arts. The one time a year we can all be whoever we want. Women can be men, men can be women, and everyone can be Chinese. And I hope you like a bit of this. Harold Meeker off rent -a ghost is Abba Naza, with the director and much of the cast coming from that show. Though sadly, there's no Timothy Claypole. The genie of the rings, the great Floella Benjamin. 
whose life peerage presumably was reward for her performance here. And I am the genie of the ring. I'll be praised black magic. Charman, what do you mean black magic? In a thin plot, which we're all familiar with, Abanaza wants money and girls. So Floella palms him off to another genie, who lives in a lamp inside a Chinese cave. Only an untainted youth who is good and pure and kind and innocent can enter the cave. Egyptian Wally. Egyptian Wally. Nostalgia-wise, there's something inherently Christmassy about effects like these sat in your pyjamas on Boxing Day, playing with your Newcastle Greyskull and watching Jason and the Argonauts. A conversation definitely happened during production which asked, what is it Chinese people do exactly? I think they just bow all the time? Zippity doo da, zippity yay. My oh my, what a wonderful day. It's quite a feat taking Disney's most problematic song and somehow making it even more unbroadcastable. Love a good old working the water pump dance though. And what are Chinese names like? Oh, Mr. Senghai. Hello, dear. Hello, Mrs. Pinkong. And Mrs. Chinese. Oh. How good it is to see you. And their street names? Any idea? Well, Mrs. Ping Pong, it's over there oh. in the street of a thousand chopsticks. You shouldn't be allowed. They should send for the Chinese police. Mm. Chinese takeaway. Oh. I bet you £100 there's an RSO coming up. For 80s kids, this is a remarkable cast. With Aladdin played by Sarah Green, Terry Nutkins as Wishy Washy, and their mum, Johnny Morris. First time in a musical, Nutkins. This old house was new. When this children, this old house was new. His wife, this old house was home and comfort as they fought the storms of life. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. Ain't gonna need this house no more. Go on, Nutkins, lad. Stealing a kiss from your own brother. Traditionally, Pantos allowed prudish societies to explore more open ideas of sex and gender without judgment. It's not the princess I fancy, it's that little missy holding the fan. Oh, if your father were alive today, he'd be turning in his grave. Uh, I've seen you somewhere before, in my dreams. Oh! But in classic farce, Aladdin's crush is the real princess in disguise. I'm enjoying myself for once. I'm, I'm free from the palace and I'm free from my parents. Confucius, he say, lucky the Chinese boy who finds his Chinese girl. The emperor, played by Brian Kant in eye makeup, won't let them marry until Aladdin stops being poor. I'm just a Chinese boy in peasant's rags. While the set just screams Book of Boba Fett, the casting is straight fire. As Ali Baba, Todd Carty. Uh, Dog me old China, we've had a hard day. And nobody wanted to buy any of Ali Baba's onions, huh? Yeah, I saw what they'd done to your stall. Kenneth Connor as Abdul, whose crew is a roll call in itself. Barry Took, Gary Wilmot. Howard of Tomorrow's World. Right. Some lovely pirate faces going on behind him. I will be Emperor of China. Hee oh. hong hong hallo. Hello. Uh, Yakida. Oh. Open sesame. Oh. As this is a musical. We get plenty of numbers. Uh, Economy or tourists, you fly through the air. You reach Peking without that gear. The perfume of roses in If you want to get to Egypt fast, 
A cop it will take you quicker than a car. A pretty girl is just like a pretty tune. Take me to Egypt quick as a flash. Terry Notkin has the acting poise of a PE teacher dragged into a sketch for end of term assembly. I am your long lost uncle, Abenaza. Abenaza? That's outrageous with a name like that, you look a right nana. <laughs> and we better fix it proper because these are the Emperor's underpants. Oh, no. Well, no, twanky, wishy washy. Oh. What Dobbin is trying to tell you is terrible news. Well, what oh. is it? I'm HIV positive. Oh! oh. oh. I'm starting to think Prince Philip wrote this. Well, who's going to do the laundry then? Well, Mr. Wu, of course. Johnny Ball reveals all of the racist tropes. I am singing this song, oh, Mr. Wu. What can I do? <laughs> I've got that kind of line, I'm shining glory blue. I've got that kind of line, I'm shining glory blue. Meanwhile, Abanaza lowers Aladdin into the looted cave and... Um... I, 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 he refuses to hand over the lamp, so Abanaza traps him in there. That's what happens. This cavern dark shall be your final grave! <laughs> Imagine you got one wish about who the genie was and what his first words were. I thought no one would ever rub it. Aladdin also wishes for enough riches to marry the princess in a fabulous lesbian, I mean completely heterosexual wedding between a Chinese man and woman. Looking at that giant biggins, I know we're all thinking the exact same thing. His dick must be the size of Nutkin's whole arm. But in a show packed with yellow face, who'd have believed John Craven to be the one leaning in the hardest? Greetings, or honourable viewers. Here is the 25 o'clock news. They still have the same hours in a day. Definitely did a find and replace on his script, changing every R to an L. Yes, even now, the suitors for the hand of the princess are assembling. She is the most beautiful princess in the world. And what suitors? Duncan. I hear singing and there's no one there. <sighs> Chegwin. All day long I seem to walk on air. I wonder why. I wonder why. Mark Curry. I keep tossing in my sleep at night. These cheeky boys are thinking the same thing you were. And now Clive Dunn's Chinese and all. Now she's rich, the Emperor doesn't mind Aladdin marrying his daughter, and John Claven Craven spreads the happy news. It's been a lovely day for the royal wedding, and the crowds have been jubilant since daybreak. Here we see Wishy Washy, the gloom's brother, celebrating Aladdin's good fortune. And here's the Emperor, father of the blind. Why us? Shut why? your row up! A late surprise sees Kenneth Williams as muster for drink, Jack annoying a really long joke. I'm certainly marvellous. Anyone know any more Chinese words? The magic carpet of Kung Fu. Oh, mother, Aladdin and I must prepare for our honeymoon. Mm, yes, Chamberlain, carry the baggage. You owe me a hundred pounds. Abanaza steals the lamp and wishes the princess off to Egypt. Give me five. What's happening? And how's this for a speedy resolution? No one even knows you're here, so you'll never escape. 
It'll be just you and me alone in the desert. Blue heaven and you and I and Sam. The Thurman Castle! The wicked Abanaza has been defeated, and so have the 40 thieves. At the palace of the pair of peacocks at Peking, the sensational and seasonal celestial celebrations are in full swing. For credits, we get the full-on theatrical curtain call. There's no business like show business like no business like no. Let's go on with the show. So there we go. Annual tradition out of the way for another year. But should you encounter anyone who moans about how Christmas used to be better, sit them down in front of this. No, no. I mean this.